The Wind and the Snow of Winter by Walter Van Tilburg Clark. It was near sunset when Mike Bernine came onto the last pitch of the old wagon road which had led into Gold Rock from the east since the Comstock days. The road was just two ruts in the hard earth, with sagebrush growing between them, and was full of steep pitches and sharp turns. From the summit, it descended even more steeply into Gold Rock in a series of short switchbacks down the slope of the canyon. There was a paved highway on the other side of the pass now, but Mike never used that. Cars coming from behind made him uneasy, so that he couldn't follow his own thoughts long, but had to keep turning around every few minutes to see that his burrow, Annie, was staying out on the shoulder of the road where she would be safe. Mike didn't like cars anyway, and on the old road he could forget about them and feel more like himself. He could forget about Annie, too, except when the light, quick tap and of her hoofs behind him stopped. Even then, he didn't really break his thoughts. It was more as if the tapping were another sound from his own inner machinery, and when it stopped, he stopped, too, and turned around to see what she was doing. When he began to walk ahead again at the same slow, unvarying pace, his arms scarcely swinging at all, his body bent a little forward from the waist, he would not be aware that there had been any interruption of the memory or the story that was going on in his head. Mike didn't like to have his stories interrupted, except by an idea of his own, something to do with prospecting, or oh, the arrival of his story and an actual memory which warmed him to closer recollection or led into a new and more attractive story. An intense golden light, almost liquid, fanned out from the peaks above him and reached eastward under the gray sky, and the snow which occasionally swarmed across this light was fine and dry. Such little squalls had been going on all day, and still there was nothing like real snow down, but only a fine powder which the wind swept along until it caught under the brush, leaving the ground bare. Yet Mike Bernine was not deceived. This was not just a flurrying day, it was the beginning of winter. If not tonight, then tomorrow, or the next day. The snow would begin, would shut off the mountains, so that a man might as well be on a great plain for all he could see. Perhaps even the snow which blinded a man at once and blanketed the desert in an hour. Fifty-two years in this country had made Mike Brennan sure about such things, although he didn't give much thought to them, but only to what he had to do because of them. Three nights before, he had been awakened by a change in the wind. It was no longer a wind born in the near mountains, cold with night and altitude, but a wind from far places, full of a damp chill which got through his blankets and into his bones. The stars had still been clear and close above the dark humps of the mountains, and overhead the constellations had moved slowly in full panoply, unbroken by any invisible lower darkness. Yet he had lain there half awake for a few minutes, hearing the new wind beat the brush around him, hearing Annie stirring restlessly and thumping in her hobble. He had thought drowsily. Smells like winter this time, and then it's held off a long time this year, pretty near the end of December. Then he had gone back to sleep, mildly happy because the change meant he would be going back to Gold Rock. Gold Rock was the other half of Mike Bernine's life. When the smell of winter came, he always started back for Gold Rock. From March or April until the smell of winter, he wandered slowly about among the mountains, anywhere between the White Pines and the Virginias, and only his burrow for company. Then there would come the change, and they would head back for Gold Rock. Mike had traveled with a good many burrows during that time, eighteen or twenty, he thought, although he wasn't sure couldn't remember them all, but only those he had had first when he was a young man and always thought most about seeing women when he got back to Gold Rock, or those with something queer about them, like Baldy, who'd had a great pale patch like a, like a bald spot on one side of his belly, or those who'd had something queer happen to them, like Maria, 
He could remember just how it had been that night. He could remember it as if it were last night. It had been in Hamilton. He had felt unhappy because he could remember Hamilton when the whole hollow was full of people and buildings and everything was new and active. He had gone to sleep in the hollow shell of the Wells Fargo building, hearing an old iron shutter banging against the wall in the wind. In the morning, Maria had been gone. He had followed the scuffing track she made on account of her loose hobble, and it had led far up the old snow-gullied road to Treasure Hill, and then ended at one of the black shafts that opened like mouths right at the edge of the road. A man remembered a thing like that. There weren't many burrows that foolish, but burrows with nothing particular about them were hard to remember, especially those he had had in the last twenty years or so, when he had gradually stopped feeling so personal about them, and had begun to call all the Jennies Annie, and all the burrows Jack. The clicking of the little hoofs behind him stopped, and Mike stopped too and turned around. Annie was pulling at a line of yellow grass along the edge of the road. Come on, Maria, Mike said patiently. The burrow at once stopped pulling at the dead grass and came on up towards him, a small black nose working, the ends of the grass standing out on each side of it like whiskers. Mike began to climb again, ahead of her. It was a long time since he had been caught by a winter, too. He could not remember how long. All the beginnings ran together in his mind, as if they were the beginning of one winter so far back that he had almost forgotten it. He could still remember clearly, though, the winter he had stayed out on purpose, clear into January. He'd been a young man then, thirty-five or forty or forty-five, somewhere in there. He would have to stop and try to bring back a whole string of memories about what had happened just before, in order to remember just how old he had been, and wasn't worth the trouble. Besides, sometimes even that system didn't work. It would lead him into an old camp where he had been a number of times, and the dates would get mixed up. It was impossible to remember any other way, because all his comings and goings had been so much alike. He had been young, anyhow, and not much afraid of anything except running out of water in the wrong place, not even afraid of the winter. He had stayed out because he thought he had a good thing, and he had wanted to prove it. He could remember how it felt to be out in the clear winter weather on the mountains, the pinion trees and the junipers weighed down with the feathery snow and making sharp blue shadows on the white slopes. The hills had made blue shadows on one another, too, and in the still air his pick had made the beginning of a sound like a bell's. He knew he had been young because he could remember taking a day off now and then just to go tramping around those hills, up and down the white and through the blue shadows on a kind of holiday. He had pretended to his common sense that he was seriously prospecting and had carried his hammer and even his drill along but he had really just been gallivanting, playing coat. Maybe he had been even younger than thirty-five, though he could still be stirred a little for that matter by the memory of the kind of weather which had sent him gallivanting. High blue weather, he called it. There were two kinds of high blue weather besides the winter kind, which didn't set him off very often. Spring and fall. In the spring... It would have a soft, puffy wind and soft, puffy white clouds which made separate shadows that traveled silently across hills that looked soft, too. In the fall, it would be still, and there would be no clouds at all in the blue, but there would be something in the golden air and the soft, steady sunlight on the mountains that made a man as uneasy as the spring blowing, though in a different way, more sad and not so excited. In the spring high blue, a man had been likely to think about women he had slept with, or wanted to sleep with, or imaginary women made up with the help of newspaper pictures of actresses, or young society matrons, or of the old oil paintings in the Lucky Boy Saloon which showed pale, almost naked women against dark, sumptuous backgrounds, women with long hair or braided hair, calm. 
virtuous faces, small hands and feet, and ponderous limbs, breasts, and buttocks. In the fall high blue, though, it had been much longer since he had seen a woman or heard a woman's voice. He was more likely to think about old friends, men, or places he had heard about, or places he hadn't seen for a long time. He himself thought most often about Goldfield, the way he had last seen it in the summer of 1912. That was as far south as Mike had ever been in Nevada. Since then, he had never been south of Tonopah. When the high blue weather was past, though, and the season worked toward winter, he began to think about Gold Rock. There were only three or four winters out of the fifty-two when he hadn't gone home to Gold Rock, to his old room at Mrs. Wright's up on Fourth Street, and to his meals in the dining room at the International House, and to the Lucky Boy where he could talk to Tom Conover and his other friends, and play cards, or have a drink to hold in his hand while he sat, and remember it. This journey had seemed a little different from most, though. It had started the same as usual, but as he had come across the two vast valleys and through the pass in the low range between them, he hadn't felt quite the same. It felt younger and more awake, it seemed to him, and yet, in a way, older too. Suddenly older. He had been sure that there was plenty of time, and yet he had been a little afraid of getting caught in the storm. He had kept looking ahead to see if the mountains on the horizon were still clearly outlined, or if they had been cut off by a lowering of the clouds. He had thought more than once about how bad it would be to get caught out there when the real snow began, and he had been disturbed by the first flakes. It had seemed hard to him to have to walk so far, too. He had kept thinking about distance. Also, the snowy cold had searched out the regions of his body where old injuries had healed. He had taken off his left mitten a good many times to blow on the fingers which had been frosted the year he was sixty-three, so that now it didn't take much cold to turn them white and stiffen them. The queer tingling, partly like an itch, and partly like a pain in the patch on his back that had been burned in the old powder blast, was sharper than he could remember its ever having been before. The rheumatism in his joints, which was so old a companion that it usually made him feel no more than tight-knit and stiff, and the place where his leg had been broken and torn when the ladder broke in ninety-seven ached, and had a pulse he could count. All this made him believe that he was walking more slowly than usual, although nothing, probably not even a deliberate attempt, could actually have changed his pace. Sometimes he even thought with a moment of fear that he was getting tired. On the other hand, he felt unusually clear and strong in his mind. He remembered things with a clarity which was like living them again. Nearly all of them events from many years back, from the time when he had been really active and fearless, and every burrow had had its own name. Some of these events, like the night he had spent in Eureka with the little brown-haired whore, a night in the fall of 1888 or 89, somewhere in there, he had not once thought of for years. Now, he could remember even her name. Armand, as she had called herself. A funny name. They all picked names for their business, of course. Romantic names like Cecily or Rosamond or Belle or Claire. Or hard names like Diamond Gert or Horseshoe Sal. Or names that were pinned on them like Indian Kate or Roman Mary. But Armandy was different. He could remember Armandy as if he were with her now. Not the way she had behaved in bed. He couldn't remember anything particular about that. In fact... He couldn't be sure that he remembered anything particular about that at all. There were others he could remember more clearly for the way they had behaved in bed, women he had been with more often. He had been with Armandy only that night. He remembered little things about being with her, things that made it seem good to think of being with her again. Armandy had a room upstairs in a hotel. They could hear a piano playing in a club across the street. He could hear the tune, and it was one he knew, although he didn't know its name. 
It was a gay tune that went on and on the same, but still it sounded sad when you heard it through the hotel window, with the lights from the bars and the hotel shining on the street, and the people coming and going through the lights, and then beyond the lights, the darkness where the mountains were. Harmony wore a white silk dress with a high waist and a locket on a gold chain. The dress made her look very brown and like a young girl. She used a white powder on her face that smelled like violets, but this could not hide her brownness. The locket was heart-shaped, and it opened to show a cameo of a man's hand holding a woman's hand very gently, just their fingers laid out long together and the thumbs holding the way they were sometimes on tombstones. There were two little gold initials on each hand, but Armandy would never tell what they stood for, or even if the locket was really her own. He stood in the window, looking down at the club from which the piano music was coming, and Armandy stood beside him with her shoulders against his arm and a glass of wine in her hand. He could see the toe of her white satin slipper showing from under the edge of her skirt. Her big hat, loaded with black and white plumes, lay on the dresser behind him. His own leather coat with the sheepskin lining lay across the foot of the bed. It was a big bed, with a knobby brass foot and head. There was one oil lamp burning in the chandelier in the middle of the room. Armandy was soft-spoken, gentle, and a little fearful, always looking at him to see what he was thinking. He stood with his arms folded, his arms felt big and strong upon his heavily muscled chest. He stood there pretending to be in no hurry, but really thinking eagerly about what he would do with Armandy, who had something about her which tempted him to be cruel. He stood there with his chin down into his heavy dark beard and watched a man come riding down the middle of the street from the west. The horse was a fine black, which lifted its head and feet with pride. The man sat very straight with a high rein, and something about his clothes and hat made him appear to be in uniform, although it wasn't a uniform he was wearing. The man also saluted his friends upon the sidewalks like an officer, bending his head just slightly and touching his hat instead of lifting it. Mike Brennan asked Armady who the man was and then felt angry because she could tell him, and because he was an important man who owned a mine that was in Bonanza. He mocked the airs with which the man rode in his princely greetings. He mocked the man cleverly, and Armady laughed and repeated what he said and made him drink a little of her wine as a reward. Mike had been drinking whiskey, and he did not like wine anyway, but this was not the moment in which to refuse such an invitation. Old Mike remembered all this, which had been completely forgotten for years. He could not remember what he and Armandy had said, but he remembered everything else, and he felt very lonesome for Armandy and for the room with the red-figured carpet and the brass chandelier with oil lamps in it and the open window with the long tune coming up through it and the young summer night outside on the mountains. This loneliness was so much more intense than his familiar loneliness that it made him feel very young. Memories like this had come up again and again during these three days. It was like beginning life all over again. It had tricked him into thinking more than once. Next summer I'll make the strike, and this time I'll put it into something safe for the rest of my life and stop this fool wandering around while I've still got some time left a way of thinking which he had really stopped a long time before. It was getting darker rapidly in the pass, when a gust of wind brought the snow against Mike's face so hard that he noticed the flakes felt larger. He looked up. The light was still there, although the fire was dying out of it, and the snow swarmed across it more thickly. Mike remembered God. He did not think anything exact, he did not think about his own relationship to God. He merely felt the idea as a comforting presence. He'd always had a feeling about God whenever he looked at a sunset, especially a sunset which came through under a stormy sky. It had been the strongest feeling left in him until these memories like the one about Armandy had begun. Even in this last pass, 
His strange fear of the storm had come on him again a couple of times, but now that he looked at the light and thought of God, it was gone. In a few minutes he would come to the summit and look down into his lighted city. He felt happily hurried by this anticipation. He would take the burrow down and stable her in John Hammersmith's shed, where he always kept her. He would spread fresh straw for her and see that the shed was tight against the wind and snow and get a measure of grain for her from John. Then he would go up to Mrs. Wright's house at the top of 4th Street and leave his things in the same room he always had, the one in front which looked down over the roofs and chimneys of his city and across the east wall of the canyon from which the sun rose late. He would trim his beard with Mrs. Wright's shears and shave the upper part of his cheeks. He would bathe out of the blue bowl and pitcher and wipe himself with a towel with yellow flowers on it and dress in the good dark suit and the good black shoes with the gleaming box toes and the good black hat which he had left in the chest in his room. In this way, he would perform the ceremony which ended the life of the desert and began the life of Gold Rock. Then he would go down to the international house and greet Arthur Morris in the gleaming bar and go into the dining room and eat the best supper they had with fresh meat and vegetables and new-made pie and two cups of hot, clear coffee. He would be served by the plump, blonde waitress who always joked with him and gave him many little extra things with his first supper, including the drink which Arthur Morris always sent in from the bar. At this point... Mike Bernine stumbled in his mind, and his anticipation wavered. He could not be sure that the plump blonde waitress would serve him. For a moment, he saw her in a long skirt, and the dining room of the International House behind her had potted palms standing in the corners and was full of the laughter and loud, manly talk of many customers who wore high vests and mustaches and beards. These men leaned back from tables covered with empty dishes. They patted their tight vests and lighted expensive cigars. He knew all their faces. If he were to walk down the aisle between the tables on his side, they would all speak to him. But he also seemed to remember the dining room with only a few tables with oilcloth on them instead of linen and with moody young men sitting at them in their work clothes, strangers who worked for the highway department or were just passing through, or talked mining in terms which he did not understand or which made him angry. No, it would not be the plump blonde waitress. He did not know who it would be. It didn't matter. After supper, he would go up Canyon Street under the arcade to the Lucky Boy Saloon, and there it would be the same as ever. I came to the summit of the old road and stopped and looked down. For a moment, he felt lost again, as he had when he thought about the plump blonde waitress. He had expected Canyon Street to look much brighter. He had expected a lot of orange windows close together on the other side of the canyon. Instead, there were only a few scattered lights across the darkness, and they were white. They made no communal glow upon the steep slope, but gave out only single white needles of light which pierced the darkness secretly and lonesomely, as if nothing could ever pass from one house to another over there. Canyon Street was very dark, too. There it went, the street he loved, steeply down into the bottom of the canyon and down its length. There were only the few street lights more than a block apart, swinging in the wind and darting about in that cold, small light. The snow whirled and swooped under the nearest streetlight below. You are getting to be an old fool, Mike Bernine said out loud to himself, and felt better. This was the way Gold Rock was now, of course, and he loved it all the better. It was a place that grew old with a man that was going to die sometime, too. There could be an understanding with it. He worked his way slowly down into Canyon Street, with Annie slipping and checking behind him. Slowly, with the blown snow behind them, they came to the first built-in block and passed the first dim light showing through a smudged window under the arcade. They passed the dark places after it and the second light. 
Then Mike Brenin stopped in the middle of the street, and Annie stopped beside him, pulling her rump in and turning her head away from the snow. A highway truck coming down from the head of the canyon had to get way over onto the wrong side of the street to pass them. The driver leaned out as he went by and yelled, Pull over, Pop! You're in town now! Mike Brenin didn't hear him. He was staring at the lucky boy. The lucky boy was dark, and there were boards nailed across the big window that had shown the sign. At last, Mike went over onto the boardwalk to look more closely. Annie followed him, but stopped at the edge of the walk and scratched her neck against the post of the arcade. There was the other sign hanging crossways under the arcade, and even in that gloom, Mike could see that it said Lucky Boy and had a jack of diamonds painted on it. There was no mistake. The Lucky Boy sign and others like it under the arcade creaked and rattled in the wind. There were footsteps coming along the boards. The boards sounded hollow and sometimes one of them rattled. Mike Bernin looked down slowly from the sign and peered at the approaching figure. It was a man wearing a sheepskin coat with the collar turned up around his head. He was walking quickly like a man who knew where he was going and why and where he had been. Mike almost let him pass. Then he spoke. Say, fella. He even reached out a hand as if to catch hold of the man's sleeve, though he didn't touch it. The man stopped and asked him patiently. Yeah? Then Mike let the hand down again slowly. Well, what is it? the man asked. Oh, I, I, I don't want anything, Mike said. I got plenty. Okay, okay, the man said. What's the matter? Mike moved his hand towards the lucky boy. It's closed, he said. Well, I see it is, Dad, the man said. He laughed a little. He didn't seem to be in quite so much of a hurry now. How long has it been closed? Mike asked. Since about June, I guess, the man said. Old Tom Conover, the guy that ran it, died last June. Mike waited for a moment. Tom died, he asked. Yep. I guess he had just kept it open out of love of the place anyway. There hasn't been any real business for years. Nobody cared to keep it open after him. The man started to move on, but then he waited, peering, trying to see Mike better. This June? Mike asked finally. Yep, this last year. Oh, Mike said. Then he just stood there. He wasn't thinking anything. There didn't seem to be anything to think. You knew him? the man asked. Thirty years, Mike said. No, 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 no more than that, he said, and started to figure out how long he had known Tom Conover, but lost it and said, as if it would do just as well, uh, he was a lot younger than I am, though. Hey, said the man, coming closer and peering again. You're Mike Brenin, aren't you? Yes, Mike said. Gee, I didn't recognize you at first. I'm sorry. That's all right, Mike said. He didn't know who the man was or what he was sorry about. He turned his head slowly and looked out into the street. The snow was coming down heavily now. The street was all white. He saw Annie with her head and shoulders in under the arcade, but the snow settling on her rump. Well, I guess I'd better get Molly under cover, he said. He moved toward the burrow a step, but then halted. Say, fella! The man had started on, but he turned back. He had to wait for Mike to speak. I guess this about Tom's mixed me up. Sure, the man said, it's tough. An old friend like that. Where do I turn to get to Mrs. Wright's place? Mrs. Wright. Mrs. William Wright, Mike said. Her husband used to be a foreman in the Aztec. Got killed in the fire. Oh, the man said. He didn't say anything more but just stood there looking at the shadowy bulk of old Mike. Well, she's not dead, too, is she, Mike? asked slowly. Yeah, I'm afraid she is, Mr. Brenin, the man said. Look, he said more cheerfully, 
It's Mrs. Branley's house you want right now, isn't it? Place where you stayed last winter? Finally, Mike said, Yeah, I, I guess it is. I'm going up that way. I'll walk with you, the man said. After they had started, Mike thought he ought to take the burrow down to John Hammersmith's first, but he was afraid to ask about it. They walked on down Canyon Street, with Annie walking along beside them in the gutter. At the first side street they turned right, and began to climb the steep hill toward another of the little street lights dancing over a crossing. There was no sidewalk there, and Annie followed right at their heels. That one street light was the only light showing up ahead. When they were halfway up to the light, Mike asked, She die this summer, too? The man turned his body half around so that he could hear inside his collar. What? Did she die this summer, too? Who? Mrs. Wright, Mike said. The man looked at him, trying to see his face as they came up towards the light. Then he turned back again, and his voice was muffled by the collar. No, she died quite a while ago, Mr. Brunin. Oh, Mike said finally. They came up onto the crossing under the light, and the snow-laden wind whirled around them again. They passed under the light and their three lengthening shadows before them were obscured by the innumerable tiny shadows of the flakes. The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County by Mark Twain In compliance with the request of a friend of mine who wrote me from the East, I called on good-natured, garrulous old Simon Wheeler and inquired after my friend's friend, Leonidas W. Smiley, as requested to do, and I hereunto append the result. I have a lurking suspicion that Leonidas W. Smiley is a myth, that my friend never knew such a personage, and that he only conjectured that, if I asked old Wheeler about him, it would remind him of his infamous Jim Smiley, and he would go to work and bore me nearly to death with some exasperating reminiscence of him as long and tedious as it should be useless to me. If that was the design, it succeeded. I found Simon Wheeler dozing comfortably by the barroom stove of the dilapidated tavern in the decayed mining town of Angels, and I noticed that he was fat and bald-headed, and had an expression of winning gentleness and simplicity upon his tranquil countenance. He roused up and gave me good day. I told him a friend of mine had commissioned me to make some inquiries about a cherished companion of his boyhood named Leonidas W. Smiley, Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, a young minister of the gospel who he had heard was at one time a resident of Angel's Camp. I added that... If Mr. Wheeler could tell me anything about this Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, I would feel under many obligations to him. Simon Wheeler backed me into a corner and blockaded me there with his chair, and then sat me down and reeled off the monotonous narrative which follows this paragraph. He never smiled, he never frowned, he never changed his voice from the gentle flowing key to which he tuned the initial sentence. He never betrayed the slightest suspicion of enthusiasm. But all through the interminable narrative there ran a vein of impressive earnestness and sincerity, which showed me plainly that, so far from his imagining that there was anything ridiculous or funny about this story, he regarded it as a really important matter and admired its two heroes as men of transcendent genius in finesse. I let him go on in his own way, and never interrupted him once. Reverend Leonidas W. <laughs> Reverend Lee, well, there was a fellow here once by the name of Jim Smiley, and they 
winter of 49, or maybe it was spring of 50, I don't recollect exactly. Somehow, though, what makes me think it was one or the other is because I remember the big flume wasn't finished when he first came to the camp. But anyway, he was the curiousest man about always betting on anything that turned up you ever see. If he could get anybody to bet on the other side, and if he couldn't, he changed sides. Any way that suited the other man would suit him. Anyway, just as he got a bet, he was satisfied. But still he was lucky, uncommon lucky. He most always came out winner. He was always ready and laying for a chance. There couldn't be no solitary thing mentioned but that fellow would offer to bet on it. and Take any side you please, as I was just telling you. If there was a horse race... You'd find him flush, or you'd find him busted at the end of it. If there was a dog fight, he'd bet on it. If there was a cat fight, he'd bet on it. If there was a chicken fight, he'd bet on it. Why, if there was two birds setting on a fence, he would bet you which one would fly first. Or if there was a camp meeting, he'd be there regular to bet on Parson Walker, which he judged to be the best exhorter about there. And so he was, too, and a good man. If you ever seen a straddle bug start to go anywheres, he would bet you how long it would take him to get wherever he was going. And if you took him up, he would follow that straddle bug to Mexico. But what he would find out where he was bound for and how long he was on the road. Lots of the boys here has seen that Smiley and can tell you about him. Why, well, it never made no difference to him. He would bet on anything, the dangdest feller. Parson Walker's wife laid very sick once for a good while, and it seemed as if they weren't going to save her. But one morning, he come in, and Smiley asked how she was, and he said she was considerable better, thank the Lord for his infinite mercy, and coming on so smart that with the blessing of Providence, she get well yet. And Smiley, before he thought, says, Well, I'll ask two and a half that she don't, anyway. This year, Smiley had a mare, boys called her the 15-minute nag, but that was only in fun, you know, because, of course, she was faster than that. And he used to win money on that horse, for all she was so slow and always had the asthma or the distemper or the consumption or, or something like that. They used to give her two, three hundred yards start and then pass her underway, but always at the fag end of the race, she'd get excited and desperate-like, and come cavorting and straddling up and scattering her legs around, limber sometimes in the air and sometimes out to one side amongst the fences, and kicking up more dust and raising more racket with her coughing and sneezing and blowing her nose, and always fetch up at the stand just about a neck ahead, as near as you could cipher it down. And he had a little small bull pup that to look at him you'd think he weren't worth a cent, but to set around and look ornery and lay for a chance to steal something. But as soon as money was up on him, he was a different dog. His underjaw began to stick out like the forecastle of a steamboat, and his teeth would uncover and shine savage like the furnaces. And a dog might tackle him and bully-rag him and bite him and throw him over his shoulder two or three times, and Andrew Jackson, which was the name of the pup, Andrew Jackson would never let on but what he was satisfied and hadn't expected anything else. And the bets being doubled and doubled on the other side all the time till the money was all up. And then all of a sudden he would grab that other dog just by the giant of his, of his hind leg and freeze to it. Not chaw, you understand, but only just grip and hang on till they throwed up the sponge. If it was a year. Smiley always come out a winner on that pup till he harnessed a dog once that didn't have no hind legs because they'd been sawed off by a circular saw. And when the thing had gone along far enough and the money was all up and he had come to make a snatch for his pet holt, he saw in a minute how he'd been imposed on and how the other dog had him in the door, so to speak, and he peered surprised and then he looked sort of discouraged like and didn't try no more to win the fight. And so he got shucked out bad. He gave Smiley a look as much to say his heart was broke, and it was his fault for putting up a dog that didn't have no hind legs for him to take hold of, which was his main dependence in a fight. And then he limped off a piece and lay down and died.
It was a good pup was that Andrew Jackson, and would have made a name for himself if he'd lived, for the stuff was in him, and he had genius. I know it, because he hadn't had no opportunities to speak of, and it don't stand to reason that a dog could make such a fight as he could under them circumstances if he had no talent. It always makes me feel sorry when I think of that last fight of his and, and the way it turned out. Well, this year Smiley had rat terriers, and chicken cocks, and tomcats, and all them kind of things until you couldn't rest, and you couldn't fetch nothing for it to bet on, but he'd match you. He catched a frog one day and took him home, and said he calculated to educate him. And so he never done nothing for three months but sat in his backyard and learn that frog to jump. And you bet he did learn him, too. He'd give him a little punch from behind, and the next minute you'd see that frog whirling in the air like a donut. See him turn one somerset, oh, maybe a couple, if he got a good start, and come down flat-footed and all right, like a cat. He got him up so in the matter of catching flies and kept him in practice so constant that he'd nail a fly every time as far as he could see him. Smiley said all a frog wanted was education, and he could do most anything, and I believe him. Why, well, I've seen him set Daniel Webster down there on the floor, and Daniel Webster was the name of the frog, and sing out, Flies, Daniel, flies! And quicker you could wink, He'd spring straight up and snake a fly off on the counter there and flop down on the floor again as solid as a gob of mud and fall to scratch in the side of his head with his hind foot as indifferent as if he had not no idea he'd been doing any more than any frog might do. Well, you never see a frog so modest and straightforward as he was, for all he was so gifted. And when it come to fair and square jumping on a dead level... He could get over more ground at one straddle than any animal of his breed you ever see. Jumping on a dead level was a strong suit, you understand. And when it come to that, Smiley would ante up money on him as long as he had a rent. Smiley was monstrous proud of his frog, and well he might be. The fellers that had traveled and been everywhere as all said he laid over any frog that ever they see. Well... Smiley kept the beast in the little lattice box, and he used to fetch him downtown sometimes and lay for a bet. One day a feller, a stranger in camp he was, came across him with his box and says, What might it be that you got in that box? And Smiley says, sort of indifferent like, It might be a parrot, it might be a canary, maybe, but it ain't. It's only a frog. And the fender took it and looked at it carefully and turned it around this way and that and said, Hmm, so it is. Well, what's he good for? Well, Smiley says, easy and careless. He's good enough for one thing, I should judge. He can now jump any frog in Calaveras County. The fellow took the box again and took another long, particular look and give it back to Smiley and says, very deliberate, Well... I don't see no pants about that frog that's any better than any other frog. Maybe you don't, Smiley says. Maybe you understand frogs, and maybe you don't understand them. Maybe you've had experience, and maybe you ain't. Only an amateur, as it were. Anyways, I've got my opinion, and I'll risk forty dollars he can out jump any frog in Calaveras County. And the fellow started a minute, and then says, kind of sad like, well, I'm only a stranger here, and I ain't got no frog. But if I had a frog, I'd bet you. And Smiley says, well, That's all right, that's all right. If you hold my box a minute, I'll go and get you a frog. And so the fellow took the box and put up his forty dollars along with Smiley's and sat down to wait. So he sat there a good while thinking and thinking to himself, and then he got the frog out and prized his mouth open and took a teaspoon and filled him full of quail shot, filled him pretty near up to his chin, and, and they set him on the floor. Smiley, he went to the swamp and slopped around in the mud for a long time, and finally he catched a frog and fetched him in and give him to this feller and says, Now, if you're ready... Set him alongside Dan'l with his four paws, just even with Dan'l, and I'll give the word. Then he says, one, two, three, jump. <laughs>
and him and the feller touched up the frogs from behind, and the new frog hopped off. But Dan'll give a heave and heisted up his shoulders, so like a Frenchman. But it wasn't no use. He couldn't budge. He was planted as solid as an anvil, and he couldn't no more stir than if he was anchored out. Smiley was a good deal surprised, and he was disgusted too, but he didn't have no idea what the matter was, of course. The feller took the money and started away, and when he was going out the door, he sort of jerked his thumb over his shoulder this way, at Darrell, and says again, very deliberate, Well, I don't see no pints about that frog that's any better than any other frog. Smiley, he stood scratching his head and looking down at Daniel a long time, and at last he says, I do wonder what in the nation that frog threw it off, or, or I wonder if there ain't something the matter with him. He appears to look mighty baggy somehow. He catched Daniel by the nap of the neck, lifted him up, and says, Why, well, blame my cats if he don't weigh five pounds. He turned him upside down, and he belched out a double handful of shot. And then he see how it was, and he was the maddest man. He set the frog down and took out after that feller, but he never catched him. And here Simon Wheeler heard his name called from the front yard and got up to see what was wanted. And turning to me as he moved away, he said, uh, Just set where you are, stranger, and rest easy. I ain't going to be gone a second. But by your leave. I did not think that a continuation of the history of the enterprising vagabond Jim Smiley would be likely to afford me much information concerning the Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley. And so I started away. At the door, I met the sociable Wheeler returning, and he buttonholed me and recommenced. Well, this year Smiley had a yeller, one-eyed cow that didn't have no tail, only just a short stub like a banana and then and, and, uh, Oh, hang, Smiley and his afflicted cow, I muttered good-naturedly, and bidding the old gentleman good day, I departed. <laughs>